Okay, hello everybody. This is week 16 of the ENM 2020 course. You can see that I've had a change of venue in our continuing COVID-19 lockdown. I changed rooms. So that was the excitement for my day. Marlon and Fernando are in the same place and Mona had a big change. She changed camera angle. So <laughs> these are the big adventures in the times of COVID-19, right? Yep. Okay, so this week I afflicted you all with two talks from me. Um, and basically it was all about BAM scenarios. Um, just to orient you, let me switch and share my screen. Uh, for next week, we are going to, yeah, you're going to hate me, but there'll be two more talks from me, um, kind of fun talks about, about picking algorithms. Uh, but more important, we'll start off with a, um, a more formal talk from Janet Franklin that's giving an overview of, of algorithms and, and such uh, for, for niche modeling. So that, that'll be a, a neat talk. And then, yes, I will afflict you with two more talks from me. So my apologies. Um, okay, so we have lots of questions. Um, I don't know if um, I don't know if you all have anything that is interesting to you. Um, if not, I'll just kind of run down the list and and pick out some questions. But anybody have anything that looks interesting? Okay. Well then, what? Go ahead, Mona. I was going to say the first one was the first one line 2061 could be a quick answer is there an r workflow or maybe not maybe maybe it's not a quick answer is there an r workflow to estimate estimate which kind of band configuration we have in our data there is a quick answer no, to that. no. <laughs> yes okay good the answer is no <laughs> yeah. and, and it's kind of the same thing for this one at 2065 is there come some kind of framework for analyzing possible BAM configurations? And I mean, that, that kind of gets to the point of this is complicated and this is subjective. And I tried to point this out at the end of my, my second talk, um, but essentially these BAM configurations are more caricatures. They're more um, kind of examples. And what we're really trying to say is, if you have a species that is distributed in the midst of fairly similar um, environmental conditions, and you can see long gradual gradients, and somewhere along those gradients, the species stops occurring, and you can't perceive any barriers that might stop the dispersal of the species, then it's going to be something like a Hutchinsonian species. Whereas if you see a species that is in a highly dissected, uh, fragmented landscape, it could be islands, it could be mountaintops, it could be um, interfluvia. But if you see a situation where there's dispersal restriction, then it may well be something that is towards the Wallacean uh, end of the spectrum. And if you see a mixture of those things, now I showed you a species that had clear um, dispersal barriers like an ocean, but then kind of gradual restriction as far as going inland from the coast, well, that's going to be classic BAM. But these are not things where a species falls into one category or the other. Because remember, as I said at the end of my second talk, it's all scale dependent. And so, you know, uh, the island scrub jay on Santa Cruz Island off the coast of, of California, if you are talking kind of in climatic terms, 
at fairly coarse resolutions, well, then you're talking about a Wallacean species without a doubt. But if you zoom in and you have finer resolution occurrence data and finer resolution environmental data, I showed you just, just imagery of the island, um, then it could become a classic BAM species or even a Hutchinsonian species. So it's scale dependent, it's subjective. All I'm trying to get across with these commentaries that I gave you this week is that if you have something that is Wallacean, which is to say where you are not able to observe the endpoints of a species distribution with respect to environmental conditions, then your probability of getting a good niche model out of that is probably pretty low. So I can't even envision how we would set up an analysis to kind of codify this objectively. Because you'd have to bring in the natural history of the species, kind of what is a dispersal barrier for that kind of species. You'd have to bring in the spatial resolution of the environmental data and of the occurrence data, because remember they have to go hand in hand. You'd have to bring in the history of the, uh, the landscape. Um, think about sky islands being well south of or well towards the equator um, because species that were moving towards the equator and towards the poles in response to Pleistocene climate change um, sometimes get stranded on mountaintops producing sky island populations. I mean, there would be so many kind of subjective uh, opinions in there. I don't think that you could turn it into something that is objective. Anybody agree or disagree or have an opinion about that? Generally, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's, it's really complex. I mean, Fernando and Marlon's simulation approach to M, which is just one piece of the BAM, and not to diminish uh, their effort and their achievement, but it might be the easiest piece of the BAM. Um, that kind of suggests that, you know, imagine doing that for two other sets of factors, including the biotic factor, which is really messy. And then imagine putting them all together. Now, there is a neat question here, um, 2066. Normally we consider barriers to movement as physical ones. And by the Eltonian noise hypothesis, we consider, we, we simply don't consider biotic interactions. But for example, in related species in which we see turnover, is it possible to consider the interaction between them as a biological barrier to movement? Yeah, really good question. Um, there are kind of two dimensions to this. One is that we have you know, closely related species that are barriers to movement in terms of competition. And that's kind of the old um, view of competition as structuring species ranges and range limits and such. Um, I personally don't believe that that is very often a factor. But there's a far more common, in fact, a dominant pattern, which is that of geographic speciation. And so, you know, this is the classic paradigm of you have a widespread species with a range that covers a broad area. And 
either a new barrier arises, you know, a river, a mountain range, whatever, or the species has dispersed across a barrier and it's a very rare event that it's able to disperse across that barrier. But regardless, if the isolation provided by that barrier is fairly complete, then you have two isolated populations. And with enough time, they're likely to evolve into distinct species. Now think back to your, your course in you know, systematics or in evolution. The evolution of reproductive isolation and the establishment of secondary contact between those species is a later process in most speciation models. So in that case, we would have a situation where um, we would have species with adjacent or nearby ranges where they are two separate species. Now, if we're interested in this species for our model, we need to think about what would happen if our species were to explore across that barrier or even just across the contact zone into the range of its sister species. In many cases, you won't know it because they may be very similar. In other cases, genetically, it may get absorbed essentially via introgression. And in a lot of cases, if intelligent observers know where the barrier is, they're just going to say, oh, that's species X, just by assumption based on the range. And so I think that would be a very, very good point that uh, the range of the other species may constitute a barrier that is essentially modifying our M and consequently would modify the BAM scenario under which the species is present. So yeah, if you have a sister species, closely related species, you should take that into account in estimating M and or in, in estimating your BAM scenario. And the, the framework that Marlon and Fernando have put together um, that does have the possibility of introducing by hand barriers. And so essentially that could be brought in that way and still included in that simulation environment. It's, it's hard. I mean, the inclusion of biotic interactions in any of these kind of things, it's, it's really hard because they occur at different scale. And sometimes the reason why they occur is it's not like direct competition between sister species, sometimes uh, other particular things. We're working now with, uh, we're doing a, work, uh, a study with sister species that they do not overlap. And it looks like the Andes is the barrier, for example. And, but there are suitable conditions for at least one of those species that, like in any case that it will allow these species to go to the other range, to, to the range of the other species. But uh, it looks like it's not competition what is preventing for those to coexist, but it looks like the plant that they depend on is not in those areas that are connected, that, that allow connectivity between the two ranges. So it's, it, it's a, an extra biotic interactor that is uh, causing this effect. And that's why this, this kind of things are hard to consider. They require not more than simple thinking and more, more than simple explorations. Well, the thing, the thing is that they are not conditions. They are a couple variables. So it's, 
I always think on uh, local water uh, cycles uh, as a good example. When we think um, on prey and um, predator, um, both dynamics are coupled. So one affects the other uh, in, in a large degree. But even uh, when we think about interactions, there's a, a huge debate on the role of uh, mycorrhiza on is, is, is it a symbiosis or is it a parasitic relationship? And that depends on the context and that depends on the community of different uh, fungi that are in the soil. And this is just uh, like the first layer, like we're just scrapping on, on, on that uh, complex dynamic. So, um, it's really diff it's really difficult to say oh i have a a, a layer of biotic uh, interactions that i can think i can um include in my models to obtain uh, a geo a potential geographic uh distribution <laughs> It's complex, and you know the the M simulations that Fernando and Marlon have put together. I think they're going to be most useful in getting at kind of the environmental component of of determining M. And as far as introducing either biotic barriers or very fine resolution, you know, essentially invisible environmental barriers like a river or something like that, probably what we should do is just be explicit about how we excluded them. But, you know, so anyhow, just to wrap up that question, it's complicated. I don't think there's any way to automate the process. And it's also a heuristic. It's something for you to think about. and bear in mind that a, um, a, a, a species that is tending towards a Wallacean situation is probably going to be a tough model to develop in the sense of it's going to be hard to get good, significant, predictive models out of that. So like there's a question uh, my question is, if you think that making a model using a Wallace's dream situation would be useful in studying past distributions of species or the origin of certain lineages, my answer would be no. Because Wallace's dream is a species that may have tolerance limits that look like this, and you're only able to see some piece of that distribution of suitability. And so getting out to the limits, which would give you a good characterization of an ecological niche, getting out to those limits is going to depend on some sort of extrapolation. So it's not a good situation um, in which to fit models. And in such a situation, what I would do is ask, here's my Wallacean species. What are its close relatives? And I would start thinking about essentially marching down the phylogeny towards the root of the tree and ask, you know, what about my Wallacean species plus its sister species or plus its congeners? And I would think about fitting a niche model at that level because by marching down the phylogeny, you can see your lineage against the background of more species ranges and a broader M, and you may be able then to uh, fit a real niche model instead of a partial niche model. Okay, so can BAM diagrams represent both environmental and geographic space, except for M, which will always be geographic unless we consider species plasticity? Um, so the BAM diagram is in geographic space, period, okay? 
it is a set of maps. But we do have a set of um, tools and frameworks and quantities, concepts, objects that are essentially the parallel concepts in environmental space. So the fundamental niche is some object in environmental space. Um, if you listen to Jorge Soberon's lectures earlier in this course, you know that we generally assume that those fundamental niches are convex objects, which is to say they don't have multiple, multiple optima or multiple modes. They will tend to have a single mode in any dimension. And that means across multiple dimensions, they will be a convex shape and not a complex shape. Um, now remember Hutchinson, Hutchinson's duality says that those, those two spaces are linked and they're linked for a species. So any M area corresponds to a set of environments. Now, M areas tend to be contiguous. They don't have to be, but they tend to be. But they may, they may map onto very discontinuous and very uneven uh, environmental spaces. The fundamental niche in environmental space should be very compact and, in fact, convex. And that maps over into geographic space in ways that may be extremely disjointed. So, for example, if you look at the, the potential distribution of beavers, well, they have potential distributional area in North America, but they also have potential distribution in Southern South America completely disjointed. They can't deal with the tropics in between, but they like those temperate seasonal situations and they don't really care about the fact that there's a quarter or a third of the world in between. So fundamental niche is compact in environmental space and disjointed in in geographic space, M is compact in geographic space and can be very messy in environmental space. And B is messy all everywhere. B can be something that is manifested in environmental space, which would be a, a concept that Hutchinson would have liked. Remember the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche in your beginning ecology classes. But B can also be manifested very unevenly in, in geographic space because you can only have those biotic interactions where the actual occupied distribution of each species is abutting or is adjacent or is overlapping. So Hutchinson's duality is really complicated and really messy because you have these different topologies of different objects, depending on which space you're in. Could we go to uh, 2079? 2079. Because I think it's, it okay. follows, it's in the same vein of conversation, I think, that we had. Okay. To run a model, do, must I decide my view of the world? I mean, taking one of the positions of classic BAM, Wallace's dream, Hutchinson's dream, are all okay. And Daniela says thanks in advance. So I don't know that you have to decide about your BAM configuration, 
but if your BAM configuration is likely to be Wallace's dream or all okay, we have a fair amount of empirical evidence that suggests that you're not going to get very good models out of it. Now, maybe the simplest way of of getting at this is to say, I'm going to take my M area and visualize it in environmental space. And I'm going to overlay my occurrence points. So I have a cloud that represents my M in environmental space. And then I have the positions of my occurrences in that same environmental space. If my cloud is big and my occurrence points are clustered far from any edge of my M cloud in environmental space, I'm probably in a classic BAM or a Hutchinson's dream scenario, and I'm going to be okay. In the simplest sense, what that's saying, and you'll hear more about this from Janet Franklin on Monday, what that's saying is I have negative data, which is to say I have lack of positive data, occurrence data, all around the limits of the niche. And so I have the possibility of saying, no, here are accessible conditions within M that my species doesn't use. And I have that, you know, at higher temperatures and lower temperatures, or drier and wetter, or whatever the dimensions of the niche are. And so that's, that's going to be something that's Hutchinsonian or classic BAM. But if instead my M cloud looks like this, and my points are way over here at the edge, then that's going to suggest that I'm going to do a bad job at characterizing this extreme of my species niche. So that's, that's somewhere between classic BAM and Wallace's world. Now, if my M looks like this and my points are distributed all the way across that, that's Wallacean or all okay. And we're not going to get a good model out of that, period. Because we're contrasting presences and absences. Do, do you think that uh, users will be inclined to then mess with M in geography to get a different cloud of points in environmental space? And I have a student uh -huh. who came with, I think, a similar question. Uh, uh, well, obviously not, not formulated like this, but the, the M, um, the extent of M. She changed the extent of M, and all of a sudden, of course, her mother, she, go, she went from a large to a small M, <laughs> and then, and then uh, her... her Concern became well. My models are not are not as as performant based on AUC. We know that the, the classical problem of large versus small M. So I wonder if 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 we go in the direction of which I like very much the direction you suggested. Why don't you uh, visualize in E space in environmental space your M and then your points? And maybe people will start <laughs> messing with M in to get well, you know, M has to be objectively defined based on biological criteria. It's not a region of convenience. <laughs> and we'll come back around to this when we do the, the section of the course on model evaluation. Mm -hmm. Because there's a, a hilarious, if you look at the uh, receiver operating characteristic evaluation methods, in fact, a lot of evaluation methods, there's a hilarious way of making your models more significant, which is just to increase the evaluation area, which should be M. If you make it bigger, the rock curve shifts, sorry, to the left, 
and your models get more significant. That doesn't make them better. <laughs> M is a hypothesis based on natural history and based on biogeography. Now, in the case of what we saw last week from Fernando and Marlon, you're taking those natural history and biogeography uh, assumptions and you're making them essentially parameters in a simulation. But there's really no good justification for just artificially saying, well, you know, my model sucks if I, if I uh, do it based on the correct assumptions, so I'm going to broaden my assumptions and my model will be better. But you make yeah. a really good point that sometimes using the proper M hypothesis means that quantitative evaluation of your model looks worse. Mm -hmm. And it may even mean that you can't get significant models out. That's exactly what I'm talking about with the South et al. paper, where no, yeah. under, under um, Wallace's dream and all okay scenarios, it doesn't work. And that's what I'm talking about. If your natural history understanding and biogeographic understanding of the group says that M is small, M is small. <laughs> and if that means that your models are crummy, your models are crummy. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do them. That's right. <laughs> That's right. In fact, I tried that um, when I was still learning. You have no idea the crazy things I did with them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that was wrong. But I, I saw the effect. At least I was able to see the effect yeah. and how that affects extrapolation and all that when you're projecting models. And of course, you are lying to yourself <laughs> when you expand M artificially. But but it's if you want to do it, do it just for seeing what happens. But do not try to publish that, or do not try <laughs> to explain pheno biological uh, phenomena or biogeographical phenomena with that. Uh, it's interesting, and you know, tell about how good your models are when you're you have you are in a Wallace world. Sometimes you can get models that appear to look like they're good, but uh, that is because only the relationship that you have of a uh, occupied environment and available environment. Yeah. So my my favorite example and the one in which I explored the most is Cuba. You have a an island that is uh, fairly simple in terms of environment. It has a lot of areas with uh, warmer, with warm environments and a few areas with uh, cold environments. And of course, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna get of a species in a relation world is a lot of points in warm areas and few points in cold areas. If you try to fit a model with that, you may end with models that tells you that there is a high suitability in warm areas and low suitability in cold areas, but that's because of the availability of environments. It's not because it's like that. You don't know if that's what's happening with the responses of, a, of the species to the environment in real life. I mean, if you have, uh, let's say, an uniform distribution of environment, and it's it's always interesting to explore what happens, but having that in mind, like uh, the relationship between what's available and what's occupied, it's also interesting to consider. Yeah, and we're going to come back to that point to when we talk about model evaluation. But just very briefly, a typical way that we evaluate our models is to take an occurrence data set and set aside half of it or set aside a third of it. And we build our models with the remaining points and then we test them with that subset that we set aside. If there is any systematic bias with respect to environment in that uh, occurrence data set or in the sampling that led 
to that occurrence data set, then you can not only calibrate a model and get something that looks good, but you can also confirm that model as having significant predictive ability. And it's just because the calibration data and the evaluation data share the same bias. And so it's a trap. <laughs> it really means that you know we'll, we'll beat this horse to uh, this. We'll beat this dead horse when we come around to <laughs> model evaluation. But your models are really powerful and really confirm only if you can manage to assemble two distinct occurrence data sets that were collected with very different methods and which essentially don't share the same set of biases. Um, just going briefly to those situations in which maybe you shouldn't try to do models. I think there were a couple of questions on uh, endemics and mm -hmm. species on islands and, uh, and about if Wallace War uh, is just, just happens in uh, islands. Uh, about that last one, I, I, I would comment that, well, what, like you could have uh, sky islands and uh, as, as mon um, um, like mountain tops. It's just that maybe the, the sea represents a, 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 a greater barrier for, for terrestrial organisms. Mm -hmm. um, but I can, I can think on, on tepuis, which are close to my heart, uh, mm -hmm. as, as uh, Gualatian scenarios. Um, uh, and I think someone asked if well, what would happen with endemics of, of islands, and uh, in that sense, yeah, you sh if, if 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 your species is endemic to a tiny island, which not a lot of uh, environmental viability, um, maybe you shouldn't try to to do a niche model or or at least an, an ENM. So, one one just commentary, which is an old hang up of mine, is that we use the word endemic very carelessly. Um, Fernando was very careful to say endemic to a small island. But there are, you know, species that are endemic to Brazil or endemic to Mexico or endemic to the Congo or whatever that are extremely broadly distributed. And so some people use endemic without saying endemic to what? And other people use endemic as a synonym of restricted range. Yeah. Endemic as in they have a tiny distribution. And so this is just a very general comment to the, the, the people paying attention to this course that endemic to what? But you know, species endemic to a single island, for example, they may be Wallacean, but you would want to look at them with respect to your environmental data. It may be, this is the example I gave you with the island data, that with respect to climate, they are absolutely Wallacean. They are in every climate combination that is represented across their uh, tiny island range, Santa Cruz Island off the coast of California. But if we were to zoom in and look at substrates or soil types or, um, you know, light levels or shade or, you know, whatever detailed dimension, they would not be Wallacean. They definitely are present in some parts of the island and not on other parts of the island. So, yeah, you know, as Fernando said, sometimes you should just walk away, if not run away, <laughs> from a particular analysis because it's not a responsible thing to do to contrast essentially yes with yes. You're not going to get good models out of it. But 
instead of running or walking away from that analysis, you could always uh, get finer resolution data and see if there are finer scale patterns such that your species is no longer Wallacean. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a very good way of addressing the question. Yeah, Fernanda said that there are questions about endemics. So the one that is on your screen to 2081, what about endemic species? <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, one approach. <laughs> try to get out of <laughs> Wallace's nightmare <laughs> for modeling. Yeah, of course, if your question is climate change effects, sorry, that, <laughs> that cannot be addressed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an interesting question. And you know, it, it gets at how do we use these heuristics and these ideas that that you know we hear about in the concept section of a course and then we try to forget about them or we or we kind of um miss misapply them um when we when we're in the applied part of of a course so when we model a species a species niches using a full bam diagram we generally model realized niches but what do we model when we don't use biotic variables? So I think that's kind of turning the BAM diagram on its head. Um, when we speak of the Eltonian noise hypothesis, we're not leaving out the biotic variables. We're just assuming that they are not the constraints that shape and structure the geographic distribution of a species. Now, from a model, note that I'm not specifying niche model, from a model based on either configuration of the BAM diagram, what is easiest to, to focus in on or perceive is indeed the realized niche or the existing niche but I think you have the possibility of at least beginning to characterize at least partially the fundamental niche, which is to say, if all we're getting is the realized niche, then we should never do any model transfers, and especially not, you know, climate change and all that, the fun stuff. <clears throat> Rather, if we're using the BAM diagram intelligently and if we are checking our results in both of the spaces of the of the Hutchinsonian duality then we have the possibility of saying I have reasonably good evidence that my fundamental niche ends here now maybe I don't know at this side you know maybe I'm characterizing cold tolerance pretty well, but I just don't have the contrasts that I need to characterize the warm side of the distribution. So all I'm saying is I wouldn't give up on the fundamental niche just because the BAM diagram has biotic and M components to it. I think with careful use, you may be able to get to the fundamental niche. It'll bring me back to my usual comment of if your project is to analyze 15,000 species and get their, I don't know, their future climate potential distributions, I would say that's another one where it's probably just a bad idea. Okay, I've done that kind of study it was a bad idea. It's a lot of work. <laughs> well, it's a lot of work to do it right. Imagine right. doing 15,000 full sets of simulations to get an M. No, thank you. And imagine inspecting 15,000 M and occupied distributions 
in environmental space. Again, no thank you. There's a place name in Mexico that you see in a bunch of places called Sal Si Puedes. <laughs> and it's kind of one of my favorite places to see or place names to see because if you don't speak Spanish, it means get out if you can. Okay, so, you know, you, if you're in one of these Wallacean situations or mass autom autom automatization of niche modeling, sal si puedes, it's better. Science is good when we are completely objective and we're, when we're willing to say, this is destined to fail, this is not robust, this is not a situation where my tool set applies. If we can walk away from things and not go ahead and do the analysis and try to publish the paper, then I think science gets better because we're more objective. Yeah. Today I got a fifth manuscript or preprint that is trying to fit ecological niche models to COVID-19. Oh. Interesting. Yet another one. Wow. And, you know, I'm sorry, but it's not in distributional equilibrium. The occurrence data that we have are horribly biased by a certain site of origin. And that predestines us to get a single answer. And that single answer is pretty likely wrong. So, sal si puedes. Get out if you can. Um, um, can we go to um, question 2119? So, I noticed from this week and from uh, last week that there are a lot of questions about aquatic organisms. Um, uh, of course, I have I haven't worked with uh, marine <laughs> or or aquatic organisms at all. But it um, I think it's it's it deserves a, a comment. Uh, I don't know what you what you think about it, but it's definitely uh, uh, defining barriers in the ocean. It's it's definitely a different. Uh, uh, it, it it requires a, a different approach than what uh, we usually do. Do you have any comments uh, about that? I, I, with, with rivers, I would say it's easier because uh, um, we can know more about the limitations of like we, we, we by history, we, we could have information about uh, the extent of the river uh, and the basin of the river. With oceanic organisms, it, could be maybe uh, death, uh, uh, bathymetric uh, variables, I guess. So and, yeah, I mean, rivers and streams are wonderful because they have connectivity and we can, we can generally assume that things in the same drainage at least have the potential to, to be connected. Now there may be environmental gradients that mean that if I'm in the low waters of a of a drainage, I can't go to the, you know, the the actual source of of that water, you know, all the way up to the watershed. But, um, but yeah, rivers and streams, you know, you have to look historically where their uh, capture events, where where rivers changed their course or or got captured by another another system. But in general, you're right. That's that's fairly simple. Big lakes or oceans, they're kind of two answers. You know, one <laughs> is it's just more environmental dimensions, and one could pretty easily take the uh, framework that Fernando and Marlon proposed last week and put in, you know, salinity and pH and, and things like that and get out a reasonable hypothesis of 
the species exploration of geography. Now where things get really messy and really different is with ocean currents. And so you may have essentially these huge vectors of dispersal and they may be very directional. So you know, the, the dispersal kernels that Marlon and Fernando showed you, I, I believe were all symmetrical, right? I can go I, east yeah. and west equally, is that correct? Yeah, the direction for now is uh, um, symmetrical. Right, whereas, you know, in a river, my dispersal is greatly uh, facilitated downstream and less so upstream. And in an ocean, you may have areas of big, constant, strong directional currents. And so that means that my dispersal kernel has to become non-symmetrical. It's, it's a future step. That's right, that's right. And maybe one of our, our marine focused colleagues can take that step. I mean, that's why we do open code publications, right? They can take your simulation platform and modify it. Yep. Essentially make the dispersal kernel directionally explicit or spatially explicit. Mm -hmm. And then the other phenomenon that you have with marine organisms, which is really weird for those of us who work in terrestrial environments, is that you have um, organisms that have a pelagic larval phase and then a sedentary or sessile um, adult phase. And my understanding is that, you know, some of these organisms on coral reefs, for example, apparently their larvae just spread out everywhere. Mm -hmm. Most of them die. But the ones that manage to find the right conditions before they die can go on and become adults. And so that, that moves them towards a very kind of Hutchinsonian view of the world because they're such good dispersers, at least at one stage in their life cycle. Yeah, definitely I would see differences between some uh, an organism or a species that is pelagic and one that is uh, uh, more associated with coasts, yeah. but also life stages are, are, I mean, as you said, coral reefs are coastal, but have a, a pelagic state. And also uh, active, uh, active movement and, and size would, would matter. I mean, whales could be probably anywhere, so. Um, well, not, not deep. That's, that's actually one of the, of the like, major things in ocean uh, modeling, uh, having ocean ecological niche modeling. Uh, they shallow and deep waters they have completely different conditions and like most of organisms they do not occur in both of them both both like sites but some of them do so that also is another complication but is the ocean is a different world dimensions they're increased they are not just latitude and longitude uh, in terms of a spatial uh, geographic dimensions, I mean, uh, and that's another like very cool and interesting thing to think about. A truly three-dimensional world. Uh -huh. It's also true. Uh, Bastian Bentlage, a number of years ago, presented an approach to 3D modeling of niches in oceanic organisms. Um, hasn't really been followed up on by the community that I know of, I don't, I don't work with marine organisms very much, um, but the methodology is out there. I'll put it on the, the site for, um, for the course. Um, and just another commentary is that the asymmetric dispersal kernels are not only in the ocean. Um, think about wind dispersed plants, okay? It may be, way easier to disperse that way with the prevailing winds 
than it is that way against the prevailing winds. Yeah, so uh, right now, at least in, in our approach, the direction of dispersal is uh, set with a random angle, and that makes it uh, uh, some, uh, symmetrical in all directions. But um, I, I foresee a way in which you just specify the angles, uh, like an interval of angles. So let's say you're in, you, you think uh, predominant winds uh, come from the northeast. So you can say that between 180 and 270, that quadrant would be uh, where, where the dispersal will occur, the direction of the dispersal will occur. And that could be a fairly easy way to, um, to tweak the code. Uh, I think we'll do it at some point, it just needs testing, but like if someone it's motivated enough, that, that will be also cool. That, that someone in fact, uh, does it. You could even choose your angle of dispersal <coughs> randomly from a non-uniform distribution. That's that's this whole field of circular statistics. And you know, you can pick you know, from a, a normal distribution that is centered on 270 or whatever. So, uh, yeah, and that again, that's why we do open source code publishing. Fernando works with Blackbirds. God knows why, but he works with Blackbirds. And, <laughs> but Blackbirds probably disperse symmetrically. I don't think they much care about prevailing winds. And so Fernando doesn't have to work on this stuff. Now Marlon, who works with duckweed, may actually need to work with currents and things like that. But my point is that you know this is going to be, the code is a resource. And anybody who is interested in modifying the code to to work for their particular organism or their sector of the biological world, more power to them. That's great. Okay, we should probably wrap this up. Um, any last comments, anybody? Okay, well, next <laughs> week we will go into algorithms. So don't miss it. This will be an interesting week. Thank you, everybody. Mona, Fernando, Marlon for joining me. And uh, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>